Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to Go Online Meetup 56. Uh, so today we have a uh, bill who needs no introduction for but for those who are new to this meetup or go bill is a managing partner at Advance Lab and he is also a co-bridge founder and also author of the book Go X Go in Action and he is well known voice in the go community. Thank you bill for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah. So over. So he will be talking us, uh, taking us through the Go Drop proposal that is currently in the pipeline for uh, in the Go community. So with that, over to you, Bill. All right. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. We're going to spend the next couple of hours going through the current draft design for generics, and I'm the real goal. Of this talk is to give you an opportunity to look at the syntax, um, to explore the draft with me, with the idea that um, hopefully maybe after this you'll spend a little time uh, playing with it yourself, and maybe going through some of your code bases and looking at where you think this can um, benefit you. Uh, and that's the real idea, uh, and and to be able to give feedback to the Go team as well. So when this does get released, um, it can be the best that it can be um, coming into the language. Now, I'm going to drop some links for everyone. Let's make sure everybody got those links. I'm not good at Zoom chatting. Sometimes I forget the two uh, selection, but I think that went to everybody. And uh, these are the links for the talk um, this morning. We've got the talk material, which is that GitHub repo, which I'm going to be sharing with you. Uh, I'll bring that up in a second. We have a, the, the link to the draft design document. Um, I won't be going through that directly, but I'm going to try to present what's in there um, for you. And then I've got a survey from Google from Google and the Go team that gives you an opportunity to honestly directly talk to uh, Google and the Go team. Um, any thoughts, opinions, and it's anonymous too. Um, and I really hope you take advantage of being able to share your thoughts and opinions. I, I really wanted, it, wanted everybody to have that opportunity, especially those like me who are not comfortable on that mailing list and not necessarily comfortable talking on the uh, issue tracker for this, right? That's, that's your opportunity. So I'm gonna need about an hour to go through the code. It's 1240 my time here. So I'm looking at that clock. Uh, an hour to go through the code and then I wanna make sure everybody has an opportunity to speak and, and um, voice some opinions. The draft is not closing. Uh, anytime soon and I'll explain some changes that are coming already and if everything goes perfectly we might be able to see this in the August release for next year I mean that's probably the big target August of next year maybe um, we'll see some stuff okay with all that being said I'm going to move into presentation mode. Here I am. Um, and in presentation mode here, I'm going to, yeah, we'll start at the repo. Okay. Now the other thing is while I'm in presentation mode, I can at some point see the chat. So um, in between things, if you have questions, um, I'll, I'll ask you at that point, but I want to leave the, leave questions, not to comments, questions, technical questions that I can help clarify, um, what we're looking at here. Okay. Now this is the repo. I've given you a link to this repo. This is, um, let me move into, I forgot to move into the generics. This is my go training repo. And I've got this folder here under topics go called generics. And this is where I am exploring generics um, for myself and material that we can teach. Now, I'm only going to have time today to go through the first six items. That's all I'm going to have time. Today is going to be much more of a teaching 
um, session than anything else. Um, the other, other links that we have here, um, seven, eight, nine, and 10, I'm gonna leave that for you to explore yourself. These are more practical examples and um, some of that stuff is commented, commented uh, well. Now, if you go into the README, I've tried to provide some information. This link right here will take you to the spec. So if you decide you really wanna read the design draft for the spec of uh, generics, I've given you that link right there. This link right here is a link to a special version of the playground that allows you to uh, experiment and play with the current draft. It's updated probably almost every day. They're, they keep it up to date with all the bug fixes and, and the changes. Um, and then it's an environment where you can even share code with the Go team. Okay, now high level overview, I'm not gonna read it. I've taken it from the draft. This is essentially what the draft is currently gonna be supporting or what generics is currently supporting for this very first release. Uh, isn't, this first release isn't going to have everything in it. It's gonna to try to have the minimal amount of, of generics we need to solve a large set of problems, all right? So, so just remember that this is gonna be coming in pieces. It's not just one big release, generics is here, we're done. But this is the high level overview of what, what I'll be going through and uh, what we're expecting to see happen, say by the end of August next year. Um, this is the admissions. Again, I've taken it from the draft. This is currently what is not slated to be in this first release. And when I say this, it doesn't mean that it may not make the first release. It doesn't mean that this will never make it into Go. It's just currently what not, what's not being focused on today. Okay, this is a, the draft is a living document and uh, we're trying to figure out as a community um, what is absolutely needed to solve certain problems or bigger problems that we have today. Now, I'm gonna be in, I have this um, GoToGo -go transpiler already installed. And instead of using the playground, I'm gonna be running off my local machine. So the README gives you the same instructions I used to be able to run the tooling um, on your local machine here. And we're basically gonna be downloading the source code for Go, checking out the GoToGo -Go branch, and then building everything. With, and then with some environmental variables, what we end up with is running a special version of Go on your machine. You can see here, this doesn't say 114, where the GoToGo -Go transpiler tooling exists. And that's essentially what we're gonna be using, a, a, a transpiler that will allow us to convert um, syntax from the draft into actual Go code and then be able to build and run that. All right, without anything else here to say, um, you've got a lot of information just there in the README file and I've given you that link. Let's jump in because time's going to fly by very quickly and I wanna maximize the time we have together. So we're gonna start with really kind of breaking down the syntax that we have and why. I think the why is really important here and will help you with readability as well as we move on. One of the things I do want you to ask yourself and explore is if this does still look and feel like Go. Is this, is this something that you feel comfortable working with when it is reasonable and practical to do so? And we'll talk about some of that as well. All right. So let's start right here. Uh, and I wanna make sure that the font and everything is large enough and clear. So um, if it isn't, just somebody interrupt me and let me know that we've gotta go with a, a larger font. But if I can work with this font, we can see a little bit more at a time. Okay. I'd like kind of starting this off with what I call concrete um, versions or solutions to problems that we're gonna be looking at. So imagine the following problem. I want to build a function that can iterate over a collection of integers and display the uh, integers one at a time. So if you look here on line 13, let's make this code a little bit bigger. 
you look here on line 13, I've written that function. It takes that slice of integers called numbers. And within about five lines of code, I'm able to do a linear traversal across that uh, slice. And for each number that we get, each integer, we use the print function to display it. And even if you are brand new to Go, um, I think if you look at this code here, you're able to, I think, really read it and comprehend it. Even if you're new to Go, even if you've only been writing Go for a few weeks, I think these five lines of code are, are, are fairly consumable by, uh, by most developers. Now, if I wanted to write a print function that worked with strings, well, here I go over to line 21, and maybe I copy and paste the print numbers function, and I go ahead and I write a print strings function, and I need a different function, right? Because this function's accepting a slice of int, where this function's gonna accept a slice of string. It's a, it's a different set of parameters, I need a different function. But if you looked at those same five lines of code, they're really identical. And thanks to the fact that print is a function that can work with any value, right? It makes this even, um, easier in terms of just copying and pasting it. Okay, great. So here's the thing, right? If I wanted to now write a function that can work with floats, here I am again, copying and pasting and writing another function to work with floats. Essentially, with this programming paradigm that I have here, using these concrete functions, every time I want to support a different slice of some type, I got to write a different function to do it. Now, it would be nice if we could find a way to write a single print function that could handle both ints and strings. And we do have the ability to do that today in Go. I can leverage type assertions, can't I? Here I wrote a function called print assert. And what it does is it uses the empty interface to accept a slice of any type, a slice of int or that slice of string. The empty interface is a way of being able to work with all data regardless of what it is. And then what I can do is a type assertion and I'm performing this type assertion on the switch and I'm asking, hey, based on the concrete value stored inside of V, if it happens to be a slice of integers, well, let's do the um, integer uh, let's range over that slice, right? And that linear traversal um, here. And if it happens to be a slice of strings, um, then we can do that as well, where list ends up being that slice of int or that slice of string. And this one function now can replace the use of these two. However, it's not really a generic function just yet, because if I wanted to work with a slice of float, I basically have to write another case statement. I, all I've really done here with this assert function is converted the uh, print functions that I was writing here into case statements. And so if I wanna add that slice of float, I have some more programming to do. Now, is it possible at all to write a generic function in Go today, version 114 of the compiler? The answer is yes. Yeah, it really is. We have a special package in the standard library called reflection. And the reflection package or the reflect package really does let us write generic code in Go. Now, if you look at this function here on line 56, the print reflect function, it's using the empty interface once again to accept a value of any type, a slice of any type. And then what we can do is use the reflect package to ask some questions about the data stored inside of V. We can ask questions like, is the data stored inside of V, is it a slice? And if it is, great, but if not, yeah, I mean, we gotta do a little error handling here, but, but that's okay right now. I mean, the return for what we're doing right now is fine. But once I know there's a slice, I can do a linear traversal in a generic way. I can access each value in each index in a generic way. And thanks to the fact that print is using reflection, which makes print technically a generic function, um, it doesn't matter what type of value there is for that call on line 63. 
Now, I've essentially written a generic function here. I didn't do it in five lines of code. It, it's taking a little bit more code. And maybe if you're new to Go, or even if you've only worked with Go for a year and you've never touched the reflection package, this isn't as intuitive as the other code I wrote. And trust me, I don't work with the reflection package every day. So when I went to write this code, I had to look up documentation to figure out what was there. So this code isn't as readable and consumable as the functions that we were writing here. But with a little bit of knowledge and time, it isn't necessarily too bad. And it does give us the ability to write generics in Go. However, is there a way or would, would it, is there value in being able to write a generic function without the use of the reflect package? It, are there opportunities where we can make that code more consumable, readable by more developers? Well, this is one of the things that the spec is exploring. And a big area that the current draft um, is looking at is places where we are using the empty interface today in Go. Are there areas where we're using the empty interface that we can reduce the complexity of what we're trying to do when it comes to writing code that needs to be more generic? Now, this is a generic version of, of, uh, of, our, of our initial functions. And I want you to go back to this and realizing that the code here is really the same five lines of code that I started with when we were iterating over a slice of ints or strings. I think one of the nice things about the, the, the use of say these generic functions is that you're gonna be able to take that same code you're writing for those concrete implementations and reuse it. It's gonna simplify the, the code that we have to write and consume. So let's break down how this function works so we can better understand it and then we can look at some more maybe complex examples in a bit. Now, what I'm gonna do is pull this, these parentheses out for one second and just leave us um, right here. And let's just break down this function one more time. So what I'm trying to say right here to the compiler is that I will accept a slice of some type T that we'll be able to iterate over and then display the value of each, each value of type T um, in that iteration. The thing is, is that I want to write a concrete version of this function, but where T is not going to be determined until compile time, right? Or at, at compile time, not by us, but by the compiler. And I think that's the big part here. There's got to be a way to tell the compiler that I'm not going to be defining T. You need to figure that out on your own. Because with the syntax that I have right now today, this assumes, the compiler assumes that I'm going to be doing something like this. With this syntax, the compiler assumes that we, the programmer, will be defining T for the compiler. But this is not necessarily the case. In this particular case, we want the compiler to figure out what T is and then generate a function that supports that type T. So we need a new syntax. We need a way of telling the compiler that don't expect us to declare type T ahead of time. And the current draft is exploring this syntax right here leveraging another set of parentheses, the keyword type, and then the identifiers of those types that we need to discover. I want you to understand that T is an identifier. It's something that we're naming. And right now you're gonna see me using capital, single capital letters to represent these types to be determined at compile time. And it's this type list that tells the compiler here, don't expect me to define T, I'm expecting you to figure out what T is at compile time. So here is the syntax that we're working with today. Now there was a big announcement made this week 
that the team working on generics, the, the, the language team, is going to release a version of the draft that will start experimenting with the use of the square brackets. This doesn't exist just yet today. There's been an announcement, and I don't know exactly when this is going to make it into the, uh, into the playground. Um, but very soon, you'll be able to use both parentheses and the hard brackets to allow everybody to get a sense of what is more readable in terms of seeing that T, because this is the important part as we move on. The whole reason of having this type list here at the function declaration is to make sure that we and the compiler know that T is to be determined at compile time. Now, I can't use the square brackets today. We're going to be using the parentheses. And um, it's all really about the same thing. I like the parentheses because as I'm going to show you, this really does represent a set of arguments that we can pass into the function. Okay. So I've broken down our generic function. I've broken down the idea that what we're trying to tell the compiler is I will accept a list which will represent some, a slice of some type T to be determined at compile time. And yes, T will be something that I'm not going to be defining, but it has to be defined um, in this case at the call site. So let's take a look at this function here and watch it working. And, and then we can break this down or add some more information here. So look what I've got here. I've got a slice of integers. I've got a slice of strings. I'm calling the four functions that we've reviewed uh, specifically here at numbers. Uh, and I'm calling the four functions here specifically here with strings. Here's our concrete, our type assertion, our what I would still say is a generic function using the reflect package and then the new generic function that we were exploring. So if I come into the terminal window here, go into our uh, basic folder, I can run the, um, oops, sorry. I can run the go tool, go to go transpiler. I can say issue a run command against that. And then I can say, um, run the go to file. Now notice that these file names aren't .go right now, they're go .to to tell the uh, transpiler to do the conversion. Remember again, it's gonna convert that go to file to a go file, and then in this case, build it and run it. And you can see that all four functions are producing the exact same output, which is excellent. That is what we want. Now, as I said, these two functions really are generic, right? I can come in here and change this to a slice of float 64, let's say. We'll do some, we'll make these uh, floating point numbers here. And if I can't pass it to print numbers or strings, we know that. Assert doesn't have the case, we know that. But I can pass this to reflect and generic, and guess what? We're good, there it is. We're now, you could see here, supporting a function that takes these floats. Now, when we look at the generic function, right? Here we're passing a slice of numbers. Here we're passing a slice of float. Here we're passing a slice of string. Um, I want you to recognize that the compiler is able to what we're going to call infer the type at the call site based on the parameter. In other words, it's, try, it's determining what type T is. I want you to know that the long hand here is this. We do have the ability to specifically pass the type information for type T. This code will still run. And it's one of the reasons I kind of like the parentheses here, because technically this is defining a set of arguments that we can pass into the function at the call site. I can explicitly tell the compiler T is an int, T is a float 64, and T is a string. I can explicitly do that. But I don't want to really have to pass in two sets of arguments for every function call. And so the compiler is going to work hard 
to make sure that it can infer the type that based on the data being passed in, in this case, a slice of integers, it can then determine that T needs to be an int or T needs to be a float or T needs to be a string. And one of the things I'm trying to experiment with over the, over the last month is, is it a smell when the compiler can't infer the type from the, from the arguments that we're passing in? And so far for me, the answer is yes. So far for me, I've kind of started to realize that if the compiler can't infer the type, maybe I'm doing something that's a little more complex than I otherwise should. And it's just been kind of helpful for me to then know to ask questions. Hey, I've got this working, but I had to be explicit with the type. Is there a way to reduce that complexity? And so far the answer has been yes. But I do want you to, I want to, I want you to appreciate the fact that we can specify the type here, though I would prefer that the compiler can infer it. Okay, so we've seen our very first generic function and we've seen the syntax. And the big takeaway right now is that this identifier T is something that we're looking to identify at compile time at the call site. And that we have to give information to the compiler so it knows that T is not going to be defined by us explicitly, but has to be defined by the compiler at compile time. And it's this syntax here that's letting us denote that this identifier T will represent some type to be determined. Okay, so we've got this initial syntax. We've seen our first function. We've broken it down. We're seeing how we can reduce complexity in the code and still write generic functions here and eliminate the need of the empty interface in this particular case. Okay, I'm gonna quickly look at the chat here to see if there's any syntax questions that is being asked. I don't see anything here. That's fair. If you've got a quick question, ask it. Now, this is the one that comes up over and over and over again why are we not using the less than greater than? I'll answer this question now and then I will move on to the next example. We cannot use the brackets. The question is why can't we do this like a lot of languages do? By the way, other languages use the square brackets instead. So Go isn't setting a precedent to use square brackets. That being said, um, it is really not feasible to use the angle brackets in Go. And the reason for this is simply because we're able to write code. I'll just do it out here for a second. We're able to write code in Go um, like this, All right? Let's say that I'm going to declare var i. We, Claire J. Um, let's even have a little bit more fun. K, okay. just so we can really see it. All right. I've got these four variables. Okay. And the thing is, is that in Go today, I can do things like this. Right. I can declare um, two variables and assign them on the same line. I don't write code like this in Go, but this is valid syntax. And remember, that backwards compatibility is a big, big important thing here. So I can do this as well, can I not? But I can also do this. Now, this is where everything now falls apart because does this line of code represent this. Or does this line of code represent this? <laughs> Woo, we're having fun now, aren't we? So you understand that 
we really can't use the angle brackets. It's just not going to be feasible and maintain backwards compatibility and backwards compatibility is really one of our most important aspects of the language moving forward. So we're not going to be able to use the angle brackets. It's, it, we've all got to kind of move on from it. It's just not even an option. But there are many languages out there already working with square brackets here. And this is going to be the next iteration of the draft coming soon. Um, and we're all going to, as a community, look to see if this syntax here does allow us or is more readable than the use of the parentheses. And honestly, I think it's going to come down to parentheses or square brackets. People are asking for other things. I don't know. All right. You see me um, resetting the language server every once in a while just to get rid of some of those um, squiggly lines. But hopefully that answers your question there on brackets. Now, um, I'm going to move on any performance in, ter in terms of runtime. There won't be any impact. Again, we want to keep that compiler really fast as well. So we're not going to do anything to slow the compiler down. And there's technical reasons around there as well. Um, and I'm going to move on to the rest of those questions at this point. Okay, so we've seen some basic syntax here. Let's go ahead and move on. Now, we are all solving data problems at the end of the day. If you don't understand the data, you don't understand the problem. And so it becomes critically important that you're able to define your own data types. And, and, and in Go, we have user-defined types. We, we call them name types, and this is gonna be no different. And there are gonna be times when these name types are going to require some form of generics. And, and I wanna share with you some examples of that. So let's start again like we did before with some concrete-based um, named types. So here on line 11, I'm defining a type named vector int, which is based on a slice of integers. And then I'm defining a vector string that is based on a slice of string. This is a, a user-defined type, right? It's not a struct type because I don't need a new data representation. I'm leveraging one that already exists. And because it's a named type, I can even add behavior to it. Here is a push method. Right? We have our value semantic receiver and push accepts a, a, a vector int, returns a new vector int, or in this particular case, a vector int with the value that we're passing in appended to the vector. Right? And we're using the append function to do this. In fact, we're using the same exact append function for the push uh, method for the vector string. The only real difference between push here and here is that it accepts a concrete value of type int or type string. And again, I want to stress that arguably we already have generics in Go. I've already shown you how the reflect package does allow you to do that. Now, again, the reflect package isn't letting you write concrete implementations. That's where the generics kind of come in here. You've got to work with the reflect API, but nonetheless, it's there. And also Go has a set of generic functions already built in, append, make, um, copy, uh, all of these built-in functions that we have are technically generic functions today, right? Look at append, it's going to work with a slice of any type and a value of any type. The only problem with this set of generics in Go is that it's not extended to us. We can't leverage the same programming techniques that the, the language is using to write these types of functions. And so, even though Go has generics here, it's not extended to us. We're not able to access it. Okay, but you can see here that I've got my vector int and my vector string, and you see two implementations. And once again, if I wanted to work with floats, I'd have to copy and paste that and write another version, where essentially the only thing that's gonna really be different here um, is the concrete type that we're using as the base. Now, we could again use the empty interface to write a more generic version of this vector. Here it is. You can see here I've replaced int and or string with the empty interface. The empty interface is gonna be a big part of this first release on where generics 
are going to give us a really large win here. Because anytime we're working with that empty interface, we're really working in an unknown state of the concrete data. And eventually, at some point, the caller is going to have to do that type assertion to get back to the concrete data. But if you look at this function, really, because append is already a generic function, there isn't a lot of complexity in writing this. Okay, we have the same push, accepts a value of any type. Append works with all of that already. However, this vector isn't bound to a single type of data. We can group many different types of data inside this vector. And I think this is when it breaks down. Because if we iterate over a vector string, we know that every value com that comes back is a string. We know every value that comes back is an int. Here, we have no idea what that value could be. And so we've got a lot of work at the call site, right, to, if we're, if we're using this vector interface and we want to iterate and print everything in it, we've got a lot of work to still understand and identify the concrete data stored inside of it. So maybe the implementation is fairly simple, but using it could get complex. And it's all because we're not really working with a concrete type. Now, here is a version of our vector using a generic type T. Again, the idea is that we wanted to find a new type named vector generic that is based on a slice of type T to be determined at compile time. Right? T is not going to be really necessarily declared by us. It will become an existing type that to be determined at compile time. And again, to tell the compiler that T is a generic type, we apply the generic type list. Every time we apply a generic type list, we're trying to tell the compiler, like in this case, that T is a generic type to be determined at compile time. Okay, great. But now vector generic in and of itself is not enough. We constantly now have to reference this type as a vector generic of some type T. And so the, the um, receiver now will say, okay, V will be a vector generic of some type T. We will return a vector generic of some type T and we will accept a value of some type T and because append is already a generic function, can work with whatever T is. Okay, great. So we now have defined this generic type of some type T to be determined at compile time. How do we actually construct any of this? Well, here's the construction of our concrete vector int and vector string. You can see that the push methods work with the specific underlying type. Here's the vector interface. And as I talked about, I think it kind of breaks down because it's not bound to one concrete type of data here. It can be grouping lots of different data and that can make things more complicated for the user. Now, when it comes to constructing variables of our vector generic, this is a place where the compiler cannot infer type. And so as part of the construction, we need to pass the type information in for T. You saw me have the ability to do that on a function call where I said, I really don't want to have to do this on function calls. The compiler should be able to infer at compile time what T is. But when it comes to these types that we're defining, there's nothing that the compiler could leverage to infer type. So we have to pass in the type information. It's another reason why I like the parentheses because this syntax looks and feels like go to me in the sense that we're doing a construction. But as you can see here, I'm going to be telling the compiler that this vector generic will be of type int, this one will be of string. Now, a squiggly line just show, oh, there we go, okay. Now, you can see at this point now, because we're passing an int, that int can flow and the compiler can make sure it generates push functions that just work with, or methods that just work with int and push methods here that just work with strings. So if I head over to our term uh, over here again, 
come over into O2 and we run those examples. You can see again that we're able to um, have our vector int and vector string. You can see the vector interface is working with both ints and strings. And then we've got vector generic versions that again allow us to work independently with these different types. Now, if I want to work with floats, technically, uh, let's use the enter. This is a generic vector, isn't it, right? And I'm going to say it's generic because I can do this immediately and it's going to work. Well, well again, it's, it's a grouping of data, but it's going to work. What if I want to work with a vector generic specific to float 64? All right, no problem. What I can do is construct another vector generic, be specific about the float that we want to use. I don't have to write another function. And what that's going to mean is that now when we use the method set push here, it means now that this push method will be specific to working with floats. There we are. And if I were to go ahead and build and run this, there it is. I now have an implementation of vector generic that's based on a float 64. And the compiler puts all of that together for us. T to be determined at compile time, T to be determined at compile time. And in this case, we are specifying what T is explicitly for the construction of that type. And then our method sets work. And again, we have that. Okay, so we've now seen how we can define a type that can also be based on some type T to be determined at compile time. And in this particular case, we have to be explicit about what type T is during the construction because it can't be inferred in this case. Okay, uh, I'm gonna look to see if there's any questions on this example. I don't see any, that's great. Uh, so we're gonna move on. I've only gone through the first two examples. These do take a little bit of time because we're really just starting to learn and understand the syntax. So that's all fair, um, but there's more to talk about. Okay, now there are gonna be times where we're writing a function and that function is gonna have to be able to tell the compiler about some constraint. There are gonna be times where we're gonna write functions that expect the data that we're passing in to exhibit certain behaviors, right? There are times we're gonna write functions where we expect data to have a method set. And that has to be guaranteed at compile time or we're gonna have problems at runtime. So let me show you how we can provide constraint information around behavior to the compiler. So we can make sure we have integrity with the data we might pass into a generic function. Now to start this, I'm gonna define two struct types. On line 13 and 22, I've defined a struct type named user. I've defined a struct type named customer. And in each case, the type implements a method named string that returns a string. And if you look at the implementation, what it's doing is stringifying in a JSON sort of way, uh, what a user and a customer might look like. Now, if you've worked in Go for a little bit, you might already recognize that this method is the method signature for a special interface in the FUMP package called stringify. And really what I'm doing here is I'm implementing the stringify interface for both user and customer. Okay. Now, if I wanted to write stringify functions that would go, that would take a collection of, in this case, user, iterate over that collection, call the string method against each user value to create a collection of the stringified users. Well, here it is again, five lines of code to do that. We construct our slice for the 
slice of string of the right length. We iterate over users. We call string the string method against each user, appending that to the new string, and we return that slice of strings. If I want to do the same thing for customers, well, guess what? Since the input is different, I need a different function. This one works with customers, but customer also has a string method. And once again, we realize that a lot of this code is identical outside of the data that we're passing in, a slice of user, a slice of string. Now, again, in Go 114 today, we could write a generic version of this. All right. Now, here's the assert implementation, again, using the empty interface. Once again, this mechanic has limitations because if we're gonna do type assertions, it still requires us to have a physical implementation inside the function. And again, if I wanna work with floats, I need another case. All we've done is move functions into cases. We can use reflection here and make the method call. This is again, technically a generic function, right? We don't know what slice we're gonna accept. We can accept a slice of any type. We reflect against it. Is it a slice value? If it's not, okay, then we're gonna return an empty, empty slice of strings. But if it is, I can now write those same five lines of code technically. I can construct that slice of string. I can do a linear traversal. I can even call the string method against each value. Now, granted, I should be doing some more conditional logic here because this code right now assumes the string method will exist. And right now there's no guarantee to that. I have to do some conditional logic here, but, but just to keep this simple, I wanted you to see that I am calling a string method against each value that we're iterating over. And then we're appending that by string, but this is a generic function calling behavior. Now, we argued this already, or at least I did, that, that this code here, I think most Go developers, even if you're brand new, can consume and comprehend fairly quickly. This right here takes a little bit more time. And trust me, I didn't write this out of the box. I had to look up documentation again to figure it out. So how can a generic solution here help to reduce this type of complexity and get us back to our concrete solution, at least closer to it. Okay, here it is now. Stringify generic, which will take a slice of some type T, where T is to be determined at compile time, and return that slice of string. And we're back to those same five lines of code where we construct a slice of strings of some length. We perform our four range iteration, our linear traversal, we call string against each value of type T and we return. But there's a problem here, you see. If I just tell the compiler that T is a type to be determined at compile time, there isn't enough information here to tell the compiler, to give the compiler a guarantee that every value of type T, as we range over that list, has a method named string. And so now we need to do is not just tell the compiler that T is an identifier to be determined at compile time, but that T also has to have a constraint. In other words, a constraint on behavior. What we're gonna say is that T just can't be a value of any type. It can only be a value that implements the stringer interface. Now, I love the use of interfaces here because essentially this is what we do today, right? I can write a polymorphic function today that says I will accept any value as long as that value contains or exhibits the full method set of behavior defined by Stringer. I mean, this is what interfaces do today. They, they define a constraint on behavior 
that concrete data must exhibit. And this a polymorphic function is saying just that. I will accept any value that implements the full method set of behavior defined by Stringer and the compiler can validate that. And so we're taking the interface, right? The, 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 the idea that the interface defines a constraint on behavior and now applying it to our generic functions. We're now gonna say, yep, we will accept a value of any type T to be determined at compile time, as long as that value to be T exhibits that behavior named string. And now that gives the compiler the information that it needs in order to validate what we're going to leverage for values of type T in the stringified generic function. So quickly here, if we look at the code in main, I construct a slice of users using all four of our stringify functions. I construct a slice of customers using all four of our stringify functions. I can come in here, run this code. You now see a stringified version of users and customers here. Now, I could spend some time constructing a slice of another type that has this behavior, but we've seen that already. What I wanna show you is the compiler messaging here if I forget to apply the constraint. Let's remove the constraint here and see what happens. Now, look at this message. And then compiler is already doing a fantastic job providing feedback here. It's saying, hey, Bill, on line 110, I'm sorry, but there's, you're not telling me that T must have a method named string, that any value that we pass for T must have a method named string that is undefined. And so we're going to need you, please, to provide information about that constraint. Here we are. Message goes away. So what I'm showing you here is that just like in our traditional polymorphic functions that we write today in Go, where the interface defines a constraint on behavior for the concrete data that will be passed into those functions, we're going to use the same mechanic here to be able to define constraints on behavior for these generic types. Again, in this particular case, saying that this behavior must exist for any value of type T that we pass into this function. And again, notice on the generic that we're passing a slice of user. The compiler can infer that T will be of type user because of the slice. And we know that user implements the stringer, the, the stringer interface using value semantics. Nice. Compiler doing a lot of work here to infer this information to make the call site look clean. And again, our job as developers here is to tell the compiler that we're not going to define an explicit type T. You ought to determine what T is at compile time. And by the way, it now has a constraint that a string method must exist. Okay, great. So we're starting to see the use of interfaces now to define constraints on behavior. Okay, I'm gonna quickly look at the group chat here to see if there's a particular question. I'll start here at the bottom. How is string function different from foo list prompt stringer? Um, potentially here, maybe there isn't, well, there probably isn't much difference other than other than, right, I'm ranging over this on line 109. So I'm able to work with the concrete data directly and then call the method. If we wanted to write this as a slice of font stringer, yeah, I guess we would be able to do that. But the construction site, right, on the other side of this function call gets maybe a little bit more complex. I don't know. These are the things that I want everyone to be experimenting with and playing with in terms of uh, if our regular polymorphic collections and functions are going to work for us, then do we really need to write a generic version? 
So it's an excellent question. Um, and definitely one worth, worth experimenting here. But I wanna, what I'm really trying to show you here is that we took our same five lines of code that we were writing with our concrete implementations and we're able to leverage that and reduce some of the complexity both in the implementation and at the call site. Um, if you, you're, you need an, if we don't use the stringer interface and use a value string, is it gonna be a compiler error? We really do need the interface here. You can't just define uh, a method there. We need an interface for the constraint. So I, hopefully that answers that question. Will the behavior constraint work against composition? Um, yes, so you can definitely compose larger interfaces and leverage that as your constraint for sure. Um, right, and I see a lot of people saying that maybe this isn't a practical example here for where we might need um, generics. And I love that. You know what? I love the fact that some of you are looking at this generic function and saying, Bill, oh, 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 I mean, we don't really need generics for this, do we? And the answer here might very much be no, we don't. And um, that's part of this whole, whole idea is to really get to focus on where generics are adding value and maybe where they're going to add, you know, more complexity. So that's all good, that's really good. Uh, the big takeaway on this example though, is that we're using the interface here as a way of defining constraint on behavior that is expected for the implementation of this function. And when we think about generics, I don't want you to think about just how it can make the implementation of a function say more readable. I want you to also think about the usability side, the other side of it. Sometimes this might seem trivial, but we're really allowing the API itself to be um, more readable or, or reducing fraud and misuse. And so you gotta look at both sides here, okay? You gotta look at both sides on, on where this is adding value, okay? And you, it may not be obvious to construct a slice of Fumped Stringer in some cases where we're working with a slice of some concrete data like users and customers already, because we would have to do a conversion, right? You're not gonna pass a slice of users for a slice of str Stringer. And so there may be cases where this actually does lend a lot of value because we get to work with our concrete slices directly and don't have to convert them into a slice of stringer in order to make those API calls, okay? And again, we're not gonna use reflection um, in order to make this more generic. So I always need everybody to look at both sides of this. Sometimes we're reducing complexity here in the implementation. Sometimes we're reducing complexity, let's say at the call site or at the application layer. And we wanna, we wanna measure both. Okay, um, with that being said, I wanna make sure that we get to the rest of the examples that I absolutely want to share here. Um, can we apply multiple constraints to, on a single type? The answer is no. You can only apply one interface to one type here. So you might have to leverage some composition if you, um, if you need to do that. And does this mean after generics is introduced the, we'll talk about that one later. Can we use more than one interface? Um, in this particular case, again, I wanna specify that you're not gonna have a, an interface list set up for type T. One interface, that's it. You may have to leverage some composition to do that. Okay, I've already eaten up an hour. Let's see how fast that hour went. And I need to show you at least three more things. So. Let me move a little quicker here for you. And then that way we also have some time for discussion. Now I've just shown you how we're gonna leverage interfaces to apply constraints around what values of type T can be, or what values can be used for type T, because now what we're saying is any value that is substituted or any type that's substituted for T must be a type whose value contains that method string, right? And we know that user has a string method. We know customer has a string method. 
and so it's all clean. However, there are going to be times where the implementation of a function will be such that the constraint that we need to apply is not necessarily based on a method set. It could be based on properties. I'd like to call properties of the data. In other words, what if we wrote some functions that wanted to leverage the plus operator or equality operations? We need to be able to make sure that any data we pass for type T is data that can operate or be used with those operators. So let me show you an example of that. Let's focus on line 16 for a second. I want to write an add function that accepts two values of type T, adds those two values of type T together to return a new value of type T. Again, type T to be determined at compile time. The problem is this. If I don't put a constraint on add, we're going to have a big problem. Not all values, not all data that I could potentially pass for V1 and V2 of some type T can work with the plus operator. In other words, if the data I'm working with is based on a struct type, well, I can't use that plus operator. And we don't have operator overloading to support that plus operation. So we've got to find a way to limit or constraint the type of data that can be applied to add because we have to make sure that data supports the plus operation. Now in the current draft, this is the solution for applying a constraint to support the implementation of the add function. And that is to define a type list inside the interface. What we're doing here now is saying that this interface defines a constraint where the data that can be used for values of type T must conform to this list. And so what we're now saying is that add is a generic function that can add two values of type T together, but the only data that we can really pass to add is in this list of string, full family of ints, and then the float 64. And now this applies the constraint that we want. Now, a couple things here that I'm sure you're already asking. Can I use my add only interface now to write polymorphic functions? Currently today, the answer is no. There is no, um, you can't do this. And I think this is where this particular choice maybe breaks down. And the language team recognizes this. They're very concerned right now that when we add a type list to an interface, it can no longer be used in a polymorphic, traditional polymorphic function that we have today. This you can't do anymore. And this is very much not like Go. So the language team is starting to rethink how to apply this type of constraint for our generic functions that need it without it breaking interfaces for our traditional polymorphic functions. And the language team is very much interested in your thoughts and your ideas here. Now, again, a year from now, we might find out that this was the best way to do it that out of all the experimentation, this ended up still being the cleanest. And now we know that we can define interfaces in Go that maybe can't be used with polymorphic functions. Maybe we end up allowing this type of constraint to flow through our polymorphic functions. I don't know, but this is part of a dra the draft that we as a community need to spend a little bit more time on. And just so you also know, you can combine um, the type list with other behavior inside your interface. We could say, it doesn't make sense here, but I'm just saying that you could define interfaces that have a type list 
and also define behavior. We can also define maybe interfaces that work with type T and then define things here like um, a match function, which takes a value of type T and returns bool. In other words, even with our interface declarations, we can make them generic by saying that certain parameters of behavior in the method set will accept a value of type T, right? And we can combine these type lists with um, behavior as well, where it makes sense. But once again, once we do this, you're not writing any traditional polymorphic functions anymore. And if I left match in there, well, that's really not going to add any value to us here because we don't need behavior named match. But I just wanted to share with you the different combinations and possibilities that we have here. And I'm working on more and more examples here that are practical, um, that make sense. I've had a real hard time trying to find practical examples where you may want to do this. Uh, it hasn't been easy. And sometimes if I can't find a practical example that's obvious, then maybe, you know, this is areas where if we see it, we're forcing it. But I might find something. So these examples I'm showing you are changing um, over time as I explore and try to find more practical examples for these types of scenarios. Okay. Now, I want to share with you something else that's special in the spat in the draft. Look at this index function I wrote. What index does is it takes a slice of some uh, type T, all right, a slice of some type T and a value of some type T. And what it does is it ranges over the slice, comparing each value in the slice to the find value using the equals equals operator. Again, now we have to make sure that any value that we use for type T can be supported in this statement. Now the compiler has added a special pre-declared type constraint called comparable. You do not have to define this one yourself. And they're thinking about and exploring the ideas of other pre-declared type constraints. But what this one does is it says T can only be of a type that can be used in essentially this type of expression, this and obviously not equals. And so there may be in the future more of these pre-declared type constraints. But here you are again seeing the use of that. And we can go in now and run some of this code. So let's explore first the, um, I don't know why Zoom is doing this to me tonight, but that's okay. Let's explore the ad calls for a second. And this is number four. So here we are, I was able to add um, integer strings and floats. And I want you to be aware that if I remove, say, float from this type list, I remove float from the type list, now the compiler is saying, Bill, I'm sorry, but you added a type list, so now we're bound to whatever types are, are set in that list, and float64 doesn't satisfy the list. Put it back, there we are. So once we define that type list, now we're really gonna be bound to that type list. And we are able to pass struct types into this list as well, that's not a problem. Um, but then we're bound to it. Okay. What about our index function? Well, I wanna just point out a couple of things here. Um, with our index function here, I've got a slice of duration, right? Or a slice of integers. I'm calling them duration here. And um, you can see here that we can call index on this slice of durations, finding this int. Now, one of the things that um, may not be clear out of the box is that um, Go can work with both the, um, can work with that underlying type. So in this particular case, it's gonna know 
that um, the int here is what we're going to be um, finding and comparing, right? Um, but when I deal with this slice of person, let's run this code here, okay? It's also able to find that um, slice of person there. I found Joan here at index two. And once again, as you can see here, um, since we can compare those truck types together in this case, uh, everything's good. So pretty cool, right? I mean, we're able to um, now write functions that can leverage these operate operations um, as long as we can comply, um, apply a constraint here to do it. And I'm going to be working on some more examples here. This is a piece of code I've been working on for the last couple of days or two, really trying to explore um, these abilities and really looking for practical ways to apply both type constraint and behavior together, okay, um, where it makes sense. All right, so you've seen now this idea of the type list. Again, language team is not happy with the fact that this breaks interfaces for traditional polymorphic functions. Um, and they're looking at other ways to apply this type of constraint. They're very much interested in hearing your thoughts and opinions on this and maybe finding other ways to do that. Again, the pre-declared um, comparable. And again, the fact that you can create interfaces that have both type lists and behavior when and where it makes sense. And this pre-declared constraint is guaranteeing that we can use, in this case, integers or these struct values in a comparable way. Okay, let me see what questions we have here. Time is running away from me, so I've got to show you at least two more things here before I do that. Um, but actually, what I'm going to do, because time is just completely running away from me, um, I've got to show you at least one more thing here before we're done. I want to make sure that you realize that you're not bound to just a single type in the type list, all right? You can define multiple types here. Again, what we're really now saying is that both L and V will be determined at compile time, where L will be used to represent this slice, and V will be used to represent this slice. And the idea is given a slice of some type L and a slice of some type V, we can range over that slice of some type V and maybe merge these two slices together. But because we have the string behavior here, we now have to comply a constraint against V. We have to say that V just can't be any value, and it has to be a value that has the string behavior. And then once you apply a constraint to one of these types in the list, they all must have a constraint. But because we don't really want to constrain L, you'll see the use of the empty interface here as a constraint. Um, from the syntax perspective. So I want you to just understand here that you can have multiple types to be generic here, let's say in this function call in some sort of type declaration. And once something is constrained, everything has to be constrained. Okay, that's what I wanted to show you there. And there's something I wanna show you here. Now I can't run this code, even though it is valid as it relates to the draft document. It just, the draft document isn't 100% implemented yet. And I'm doing something here that isn't implemented, but eventually it will be, and this will work. I'm also not sure this is what I want people to do either in terms of writing generic functions. But it was an interesting example that I was exploring um, this week, and there's some other aspects to it I really need to make sure that I share. So I've defined a type named user, and I've written a function called insert user. Now what insert user does is it accepts a value of type user and formulates an insert statement, executing that. Notice that it only needs name and email. And then what it does is it after the execution of the query, it gets the ID that was generated by the database for this ID. 
it assigns it to the copy of that user value that was passed in and returns a new user value out now that is complete with the ID. I like writing um, CRUD-based APIs like this using value semantics, where the user value comes in, it's incomplete, and then it's returned as a complete um, initialization. I think it helps to reduce a lot of misuse and fraud when you're doing things like this. Um, and so the intelligence for inserting a user is really on line 17, we need that query. This is fairly generic, this is fairly generic, but then we go back to being very specific about a user because we're accessing the ID field. And if I wanna do the same exact piece of code for a customer, well, the query changes, but this code doesn't change, this code doesn't change, and now what we have here is the ID assignment because we know a customer has an ID field. Now, when I'm thinking about how can I write a generic insert function, you know, the first thing that comes to mind here, and I'm just gonna kind of steal some code here for a second. The first thing that comes to mind is, well, you know, I need to make customer I need to decouple this code from customer, right? In other words, what's important here is that I've got an assignment and I've got a query that's based on some arguments. And so where your brain might go is, is okay, well, that's easy. You know, we'll pass the query in and um, maybe what we'll also do is accept the arguments as well. Um, this function here accepts arguments, you know, uh, maybe like uh, this. So, you know, we could do this and pass the arguments in. So that would be one way to handle this problem. But I still have this issue with zero value on the return. I can't use customer. And I still have an issue here. Now you might say, well, I know how to solve this problem. You know, I, what I'll do is, maybe what we'll do is we'll define an interface. Maybe we'll call it the setter interface. And what we'll do then is say that V will have a set method and it will return this ID. And then um, at that point, uh, I don't know if we return V as a setter, I don't know. Right, but your brain starts kind of going in this direction here. Or you say, you know what, I'm gonna break this API now and we're, we're gonna just do this and I won't have to return it. And you see what's happening here. Now, I don't mind this and I don't mind this, but this bothers the heck out of me. I do not wanna write setters and getters and I don't wanna add behavior because I'm trying to force something to be generic. This to me is a huge, huge, huge warning sign in what I'm doing here. I love the idea that there's an ID field here and I can just assign to it. It requires no extra work but to access the ID field. This requires a new interface. It requires behavior I do not want to write in Go. It now also breaks maybe this idea of the value semantics around mutation, which I'm leveraging for some better integrity. So all of this starts to break down here and I, I start to cry. And so I'm starting to think, how can I maybe write a generic function that lets me keep my concrete implementation the way it is, or at least similar? Remember, everything I've shown you up to this point has been basically taking a concrete version of code and being able to reuse it almost perfectly by substituting the concrete type for a type of some type T, okay? And either that's made implementing that function um, cleaner or it's allowed the caller to work with data cleaner. Okay, so how could we potentially, and again, I'm not sure I want to do this, but how could we potentially write a generic function of insert without going down the interface path of writing a setter? So again, instead of passing user or customer, 
we say that we're going to pass a value of type T. So we're going to use a value of type T on the input and we'll return a value of type T on the way out. So I've solved my user customer issue here. Um, and by passing query and the arguments, I've solved that problem here. So now I can pass the query and the arguments through. We can execute it. I can get the last ID. And now we have this problem because I want to access the ID field directly. The problem is I now need to give the constraint to the compiler that only values that have an ID field can be used for values of type T. And so here I go and I say, okay, good. What if I define an interface, maybe I call it the inserter interface right now for lack of a better word. And I use my type list to say only values of type user and customer can be used in this insert function. Well, that gives the compiler enough information to know that this ID field is going to exist. And now what I've done is I've written a generic version of insert that isn't going down this path of extra methods um, for setters and getters. It lets me work with the ID field directly. Um, we're just gonna constrain what our concrete types are, they're gonna use it. And in a real live application, these types are constrained anyway. And if we forget to add one to the list, the compiler would tell us. Now, again, I'm not 100% sure I wanna write functions like this, but the, this is some of the experimentation that I'm, that I'm having to see when and where maybe generics works. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe you're looking at this freaking out. Um, maybe you think it's cool. I don't know enough yet. Uh, and I'll talk to that in a second. But the other thing I wanted to share with you is that when T in this case is gonna be a return type, we run into some problems of zero value returns. I want you to notice back in the concrete implementation that I'm returning the literal construction here, right? Of a customer on the return site, or I pass nil for error. And we're taught to do this in Go, return the zero value for things when that's really not what we want to express on the way out. You see me doing it on user. I'm constructing user values set to their zero value here. This is a really good idiom in Go. I love this idiom, I teach it quite a bit. And so I suddenly have this, a problem here. I wanna return a value of type T set to its zero value. So how do we do that? There's essentially two ways to do that in the spec. The way I've chosen here is to declare a variable named zero of type T set to its zero value. We know that we'll do zero value construction for whatever type T is. And then I can use that variable on the return. I kind of like this. The other option is that we can use the new function to construct a value of type T set to its zero value. The problem is that returns a pointer. So in this particular case, we're gonna to have to dereference it. Even if T is a pointer type, the dereference will work every time. And so this is the other way if you really want to do the actual construction at the return site, you would have to do that logic. If you don't want to use that, which I don't really like, this kind of bothers me. I don't like the use of new personally. Then you have the zero construction here. And I think as a community at some point, we're going to have to face this question and decide what idiom we like better, or the language team comes up with something else for zero value. Um, but they both will work. So that's something for you to experiment with. Okay, so I've gone through all of the code I've wanted to share with you. I've tried to give you some ideas of where maybe things could work and not. Um, and I'm constantly still working on the returns example and the types constraint example to try to add more to it and make it more practical. But on your own, I think you could, I would love for you to look at seven and eight and nine and 10 to give you more practical areas on where generics I think are really going to be a huge win for Go when it gets released. Okay, what I'm going to do now is 
Stop sharing for a second. I'm gonna come back to our chat window and go through that chat so and try to answer as many questions as I can there and then maybe share some more thoughts with everybody here uh, before we close out. Uh, I'm just gonna read it backwards right now. Oh, maybe I won't read it backwards. Let me, actually, I'm gonna read it backwards right now just because it's easier. Can you add V to the type list, I think? You mean you wanna add a generic value of type V to a type list? I don't, oh, let me look at the next one. How to define type behavior constraint for return values of function. Let's say the input of type T and return value is of type V. Can you define type behavior constraints for? Um, I'm not sure I understand that question. If the return type is a type, so I'm not sure where the constraint would come in there. Um, so for questions that I can't answer because I'm, I don't fully understand them, what I am going to ask people to do, again, we have time here. Um, I've just dropped my email in the chat. If you have a question and I'm saying to you, I'm not sure I completely understand it. The best thing to do is to write it up and send it to me and we'll look at it and explore it. And maybe it's uh, an example that we should put into this training material to teach others here. Um, but it looks like if I go backwards, we're going to have a big problem here. So I'd like to answer as many questions as I can. The question is finding them here first. So I, what is your suggestion since we don't really have a, a Q and A kind of thing here? Did you see kind of questions as we went on here? I have all, uh, I have also not participant to unmute themselves. So if you have any question, please raise your hand. We can, uh, in uh, turn by turn, we can, uh, you can ask the questions. So I see a question here, according to you, what effect will be on the reflect package? Uh, the reflect package is fully gonna support the generic types. They're gonna build all the metadata out. They have to go is all about making sure there's backwards compatibility. That's why that type list inside of the interface is a little questionable because suddenly we can't write those polymorphic functions anymore with those particular interfaces. Yeah. So uh, generics is going to be fully supported. That won't be an issue. And so then we have a question from Sumit. Yes, Sumit, please go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks, Ankur. Hi, Bill. So uh, I was asking in the chat window that uh, the type constraints we are adding on types, right? Uh, what like why do we have to whitelist these types uh, for certain constraints, right? Uh, is it because more of a, like adding some limitations on what are the fun uh, types you want to give to that generic function? Or is so, there uh, more, the question is more of, uh, because uh, I, I was thinking a uh, compiler could infer that uh, these are the function types that could, uh, have, for example, string function or addition capability, then why uh, have whitelisting or constraints? I'm not on the team writing the compiler, but I'll give you my guess, okay? Compiler performance is really, really important and critical. And sure. the compiler um, really limits the number of passes around these ideas of look-aheads to be performant. And it could be that if we don't define this set of lists, maybe it causes the compiler to have to do more work to do these types of checks or infers. I don't know. Sure, now, sure. That, that could be a valid reason too. But yeah. if you send me an email with this question, I'd be more than happy to send it to um, the language team to give you a much more defined answer, okay? Sure, sure. Thank but you, I'm good. guessing, I'm guessing that it's helping them right now be able to not have to do this huge look ahead maybe. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. A lot of times if the compiler, if the, Compiler is asking us to do something. It's it's going to be because it can't infer it, or there's some performance issues around it. Uh, 
Okay, I like this. So if you have questions, um, I don't see the raise hand, but definitely, yeah. why don't we do that instead of me going yeah. through the yeah. list? Yeah, we have another question. Uh, yeah, Ankit, please go ahead. Uh, hello, am I audible? Uh, I, need, I need to raise his volume up. Yeah, can uh, you? Am I audible now? Is it better? Yeah, yeah. it's better. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Bill, for uh, the amazing, uh, amazing talk. Like, uh, never got time to read the spec, and like, this was really amazing that you introduced all of us to uh, the uh, concepts of generic. Uh, so my uh, uh, point was basically I, I mentioned this in the chat as well, but basically the uh, thing is that uh, to me it appears that adding the type list in the interface is kind of making the interface like conditionally behaving differently just to have that whitelist kind of thing like we are calling it whitelist uh, so why not have like a um, another construct altogether uh, which uh, is not an interface but another interface uh, another uh, construct which can just uh, be used to specify the type list uh, this will probably not break interface and uh, like it can just behave separately because it's anyway a conditional behavior uh, to me uh, so like does that make sense or it, uh, it, 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 it could very well make sense. And these ideas that you have, the language team wants to hear them. Mm -hmm. So what, what is, there's an opportunity for you to kind of, even though you can't run the code, mm -hmm. if you could take these ideas you have and kind of write them up in what you think the code would look like and how it can be applied. then these are ideas that uh, I can share for you with the language team. Or we have a survey that I've listed, I'll drop those links again, where you'll have an opportunity to, to share some of this stuff as well. Um, I personally don't wanna see another keyword or another sort of type. So, um, because I think that adds more confusion. Once you define another, where they had contracts before, I think it adds another layer of confusion around uh, variable declarations and things. Okay. So uh, your ideas are interesting. I'd love to see them in code and then um, we can talk about it. So definitely write this up and send me an email and let's experiment with what you have. And then I can help you get those ideas over to the language team to, to validate some of them. And then if they're really if they think there's some real value there, and then we can put them up in, in the uh, issue list there, and then you can have wider community discussion uh, for sure. But you need to really think about a lot of, a lot of things when, when we start thinking about it. But I like the idea. Let's, let's experiment with it. Also, there was for a, a contract keyword, there is also an issue which respects uh, people are uh, open, uh, Voicing their opinion over their contract, you can also check out that issue regarding the adding an extra keyword. Got it. Uh, got it. Uh, so j just another uh, question, uh, or rather uh, a point that I wanted to make is that uh, so one of the most uh, uh, probably not not the not the worst thing, but uh, like a pain point for me in Go is that. Uh, 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 like uh, type uh, type conversion or like do you call it type conversion or uh, uh, end a function call uh, look very similar like right like uh, int and then parentheses and the variable uh, versus something like a function call parentheses and a variable uh, so uh, one thing that you showed was that you can explicitly pass a, a type to a generic function or um, like something that is uh, that that has to do with generics so uh, like doesn't this complicate uh, it a bit more because now you have not just two but like a like third level of uh, this thing that like three things are uh, three things appear similar so I, I think it's an interesting point when it comes to a function call again if if you have to do this i would make an argument that maybe we're doing something wrong or making things more complex than they need to be. So on the function call side, I think that we should really be able to infer the types in most cases. I have some examples 
in that heap where we can't. Remember the new syntax now is, is, is gonna be this for doing that once this kind of rolls in. So they're looking at getting rid of the extra set of parentheses and using square brackets. And that would also at some point apply here where the square brackets would come in instead of the parentheses. And so um, in, a, in a week or two, I think we'll be able to kind of experiment with that, those operators in this case um, to do it. And maybe that solves some of the problems that you have. You know, I've been looking at this code for like two months now. So the parentheses are kind of embedded in my brain a little bit. And the fact that they can, they are in a sense being passed into the implementation in a sense to define the type kind of works for me. But um, I, you are, you're not alone in what you're asking in terms of maybe the confusion of this kind of stuff. So we'll see, um, we'll see where this goes over the next couple of months when the square brackets come in, right? Cause you had this, so you have this. So, yeah. You know, so interesting, right? So, yeah, BJ, please go ahead. Uh, hey, uh, good morning, guys. Hey, Bill, thank you again. Uh, you do such wonderful work for all of us. Uh, I just wanted to add to the conversation to a particular question that was asked repeatedly. Uh, for example, why can't format.stringer uh, just be used as part of the parameter list? Right? Uh, I've put a small bit of code in the chat uh, at, um, uh, with the uh, go to go um, play link that shows an example where you can't use that because you don't have concrete types. So uh, if anybody wants to take a look at that. Uh, is this one right here that you shared? Yeah, yeah. So this is a case where you can't use something like format.stringer because if, you, if for example, you're trying to swap two variables, uh, if you maybe reduce the font size with a command minus. You don't need a, well, you don't need stringer here because you're not calling a string method here. Absolutely. So there was a question, why can't you, uh, in earlier when you gave the format.stringer example, why couldn't you just do interfaces there? Why do you need generics, right? And that is possible when um, you don't need to work with concrete types. So in this particular case, line number 28, um, you can't do something like this because if you try to swap two concrete variables, you'll have to get it back as an empty interface. And then you need to type assert it again. Um, whereas with something like generics, it will be possible to uh, work with uh, something like this. So I just want to add to the discussion where there were about three, four questions uh, of that type. Oh, this is brilliant. And um, I saved this because I did want to study this code more after or early, later today, because I think this is a really interesting example that I might want to add to the training material. Teach, I really appreciate cool. you taking the time to write this. Thank you. Um, but my brain isn't, doesn't work very fast, especially at two o'clock in the morning. So I need more time to consume some of this stuff, which is, again, I'm, I'm feeling a little slow right now because it's two in the morning for me. But um, yeah, I, I love this. So I'm going to ex experiment with this more. In fact, if uh, that was VJ, can you send me an email, please, with this example as well? That way um, we can talk, I can talk to you when my brain is functioning better. Sure, but uh, I think you, if you're just even 5% awake, you will get it. There's absolutely uh, nothing that you can't do this. So um, anyway, cool. No. I shall still do that since you asked. No, I like it. Okay, brilliant. Right. Yeah, send me an email with that anyway. Okay. Yeah, so I am, I'm going to be honest with you, right? I am, I'm trying to put examples together that are both teaching this stuff. At the same time, I really do want to give you practical examples because if I don't, then it just lends to confusion about when should we be using generics and when shouldn't we? And I've been working really hard on some of these later examples 
um, to make that happen. And I'm not there yet. I'm not there a hundred percent yet. I'm still, still looking for that, uh, for some of it. Right. So if, uh, if some of the examples confuse you because they're not as practical as they could be yeah, there, there, I apologize. But the real goal tonight was to make sure that you could get a good sense of the syntax, how it's going to work, why we're doing some of the things we're doing. And I would really love for everybody to take an hour out of their day next week to either experiment with some ideas in your head or look at code you have today in some of the projects that you're doing at work or personal projects. I would first explore where you're using the empty interface today and see, can we leverage generics there to make my life better, right? I think anywhere the empty interface is and we're having to do um, explicit type assertions to get back to the concrete data, there's a, there's a huge win there, right? Huge win there, whether it's on the return site or it's on, on the parameter list. So. I want that feedback. You can send it to me directly again, or we can send it to the language team. I'm going to do this just one more time because there's a lot of chat there. Put those links back there. All right. So currently, uh, I will be posting this from the Google survey link over our meetup also. So any guys who have missed this uh, from the chat, they can also access this Google survey from the meetup. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, Bill, I have one question. Uh, yep. Yeah. So, most of the time, you know, um, people uh, advice means people we don't often use empty interface because the uh, as Rob Pike has said, right? The bigger the uh, interface, the weaker the abstraction is. So, when uh, the advice you get that we should be looking into the condition that where we can leverage this uh, empty interface for our uh, generic use case. Uh, aren't these two just the conflicting ideas that we are talking about in terms of programming idioms? So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say two things here, okay? Mm -hmm. um, what I teach and what I, what I would like more developers to do yeah. is not design their software from a point of abstraction first. Yes. Like, Many of us do, right? Don't design with interfaces, discover them. And so what, what I think is that if you are writing concrete implementations of your problem first, we write that, we, we, we write the solution first using that slice of int or that slice of user or that user, whatever it is. And we validate that when we're working with that concrete type, we're working with our concrete implementations, their sound, and they're where, where we want to be. Then we ask, hey, is there a need for this to be polymorphic? Is there a need for me to work with something other than a user? You may have already answered that question days ago. And because sometimes you answer that question days ago, you start with an interface. What I'm saying is don't start with the interface, even if you already know the answer is yes. What I'm saying is write that concrete implementation first. And now with generics, you have, you have an extra question. See before, if the answer was, yes, this needs to be polymorphic. I need to work with any value. Then you would define an interface specific to the behaviors that that function requires. That way you don't have these bloated interfaces, right? We maintain a level of precision. We go, oh, well, this function's only using this method, method of behavior. Let's define an interface for that. That function's using two. Let's compose a larger interface. This is why we have a reader and a writer interface and a closure interface. And then this is why we have the reader writer and the read write closer. And we, and we leverage composition. I think the struggle now is going to be, okay, this needs to be polymorphic. Should we make it, should we use our interface in a traditional way or should we write this as a generic function? Like now it gets, it gets interesting there. But I think for me right now, again, I'm, I'm learning this as much as anybody else. For me right now, I think what I wanna set as a guideline is write your concrete implementation first using one concrete type. Ask yourself, does this need, be, does this need to be polymorphic? The answer is yes, ask yourself, 
Will a traditional polymorphic function with our interface work? The answer is yes, do it. Stay there, right? If the answer is it will, but it don't feel right, then ask, well, will the generic version of this function work better? And right now, the only time I'm saying that a generic function seems to work better in that particular case is when the interface you're going to be using is the empty one. If you can define a well, if you can divide, define a precise interface for the implementation, then use it and do it. But at the end of the day, if the only solution is, well, I need the empty interface to do this, and I'm going to have to use reflection, and or I'm going to be doing type assertions, now generic starts to make some sense because if I can eliminate the type assertions, that's cleaner for everybody. Uh, I don't know if you're going to replace reflection in every particular case. There are real use cases for reflection, decoding and, and encoding, unmarshalling, you know, marshalling. Uh, I don't know if that should be done in, 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 a, in a generic way as, as opposed to where reflection uh, validation, data model validation. Well, we've got our tagging system, right, on, on, on types. That's like, that's like beautiful stuff for reflection. So I'm not going to sit here and say that all areas where we're using reflection can be replaced with generics. I think that's silly. But I do think that where the empty interface is, it, I'm not going to say all areas there either, but it seems like to be a really strong candidate with this current um, draft imp implementation. So concrete first, always, then ask, do I need to work with more than one type? The answer is yes. Let's go after the interface first. If there's still some misuse or fraud related to that because of type assertions, maybe because of uh, more complicated reflection code that can be reduced, then I think we look at uh, generics. And my examples in the beginning have tried to show you that progression, right? Concrete type assertion, asserts, reflection, generic. So you can kind of look at the complexity of the code of writing and then the complexity of use. Now, one thing I've asked the Go team, I've asked them several times and I'll continue to ask them, is that at the moment that it's identified when this is going to get released, Let's say we identify that August next year, whatever release number that is, we just have 15s coming out, and then we're going to have, it's August now, 15, 16, 17. So, so 17 or 18 are potential version numbers for this. So when 17 or 18 come around and, and we've decided that this is going to be in a release, I've asked the language team, to buckle down and provide documentation on design philosophy and guidelines and examples, core examples of where generics really will work better than what we're doing today in the language. And I've asked them to make sure that they lay down this foundation. So we're not guessing and I'm as a teacher not just voicing my opinions that are going to be different than everybody else, that we've got this kind of rock to stand on in terms of best practices here. Now, I'll tell you, I'm excited about generics for a couple of reasons. Um, and I didn't, don't have time to explore these other examples. But today we have the context package, which is, has a value bag using the empty interface. How cool would it be to be able to use that as a concrete type. Because I can show you code today where I've got type assertion help. And everywhere I do want to type assertion out of the context, if that value is not there, I mean, I, I'm shutting things down. Like there's a huge amount of complexity that can be reduced in the context. There are two really cool types in the sync package called map and pool. And they've been engineered around cache coherency problems for performance. They, they deal with the caching systems and, and fault sharing. And they, they've got all this amazing engineering. But in order for them to work, you've got to work with the empty interface. And so we're, again, type assertion hell with all that. This would be nice to have 
maps and pools in the sync package that are specific to a given concrete type. We're also all writing our own concurrency patterns every single day. We're all writing our own fan ins and fan outs and pooling. And it, we could now have with this draft implementation, a concurrency patterns package or the sync package can get, can, can get much more complete. And I really do expect this stuff to happen. And I've experimented with channels. That's item number 10 in the material. So you can get a sense of what that might look like. It, these, these channel patterns and concurrency patterns are going to ask for functions at the end of the day. They're not going to use interfaces. We'll ask for literal functions um, to do things. But the core guts of that concurrency, there's no reason now why that can't be, that can't be provided in a, in a generic way. And all of these things, just, just these things alone that I'm sharing with you are going to stabilize a lot of Go software yeah. in the future. Yeah, completely agree, Bill. Means most of the folks who are starting with Go try to uh, you know, design the interface first and forgetting that the Go has this structural typing system, not a nominal type system. So you can have replace interface any point in time, first have your you know, uh, the concrete type implemented and figure out do you really need interface or not. So uh, with that, uh, thank you, Phil, Bill, for taking your time and doing this. Uh, maybe, Bill, you want to update uh, the folks over here for your mentorship program. That we right. Talk. So I guess you're the first group I'm going to tell this about. Starting on Monday, um, GoBridge is signing some contracts to put up a system for mentoring specifically. It'll be completely white labeled for Go in the, and um, I think we're gonna include mm -hmm. Kubernetes environment. Okay. Um, and so what this means is, is that now, instead of all this mentoring pairing going through me, yeah. <laughs> if you need help, you'll be able to put up a profile of exactly who you are and the kind of help you want. And then um, we need mentors. So if you've got that experience and you wanna help people grow in their careers and their life, you can join as a mentor. I'll probably be doing the pairing initially until we allow people to find themselves. Um, but this is coming. So uh, I'm really excited about um, getting this thing launched, hopefully before the end of the month. So uh, once you start seeing announcements, uh, really, really consider if you're somebody who's got that experience already to help somebody um, who needs your help. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I guess that's uh, it for today. Uh, thank you again, Bill, for uh, having uh, this nice talk and taking your time. And I know it's quite late for you. It's already to pass two over there. So thank you again. And thanks, everyone. That's fine. All right. Play with this stuff. Fill out that survey. Get your feedback yeah. in. And reach out to me if you need anything. Yeah, sure. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.